Buddha says that we suffer from the craving that leads to becoming. So that's what we have to focus on. What is becoming? What is that craving? And how do we get out? He sets a special problem because the craving that leads to becoming includes craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, which makes sense, and then craving for non-becoming, which stands out. So if you try to put it into becoming, if you have a state of becoming in the mind, and you try to put into it, that's actually going to create more becoming. So how do we get out of that dilemma? And the answer is that you watch things as they have come to be. And particularly, you look at the processes of fabrication as they come together and eventually lead to a state of becoming. There are many steps. That's what dependent core rising is all about. And so you learn how to look at the steps leading up to becoming, and you realize that it's not really worth it. And you can just let it go. You don't have to destroy it. You attack it at the cause, not at the result. So how does that relate to what we're doing right here, right now? Well, one, when the Buddha teaches breath meditation, he talks a lot about fabrication. You get sensitive to bodily fabrication and you calm it down. You get sensitive to mental fabrication and you calm it down. Learning how to see the way you breathe as a fabrication. It's not just a given. I was talking this evening to someone and said, What's it, why do we not let people breathe naturally? Well, your nature of breathing is that it is intentional. It is fabricated. And you don't really realize that until you start doing it consciously. Then you begin to realize that the subconscious ways in which you adjust your breath. As for mental fabrication, we're trying to give rise to a sense of well-being, a feeling of well-being. And then we notice how that has an impact on the mind. We use different perceptions to get the mind with the breath. That's mental fabrication, too. And here again, you get sensitive to that, and then you try to calm it down. So you're combining tranquility and insight in that way, just seeing things as fabrications. They're put together. The nature of fabrications is that they're going to be in constant, but here you're trying to create something constant out of them to push against that. They tend to be stressful, but you can learn how to find some pleasure in them. And ultimately, they're not worth seeing as yourself or yours, but you're going to try to get them under control as much as you can. So you can study these processes in the mind. Because if you're going to step out of a state of becoming, first you have to realize that it's not worth it. And to see that it's not worth it, you create a better state of becoming. This is what you're doing as you get the mind in concentration. You've got a sense of you right here, where you are focused. And the world in which you're focused at the moment is the world of your awareness of the body. And that particular becoming is going to be really useful for stepping out of other becomings. Because you know in the Buddhist descriptions of establishing mindfulness, there are two activities. One is staying focused on say, the body in and of itself, or feelings in and of themselves, or the mind in and of itself. And the other is putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. The first emphasizes the focus, the second protects the focus. But it combines tranquility and insight in a different way. The Buddha recommends a five-step program to take apart 
the becomings that tend to form in the mind. And it's good to master that program because you're going to need it as you, as you age, as you go ill, and as you die particularly. Because at that point the mind is going to be pushed out of its human level becoming. And it's going to want to find another type of becoming, a new identity and a new world of experience. And at the very least you want to do that skillfully. Otherwise, as the Buddha said, it's like a fire that's been blown from one house to another. It latches onto the wind and goes wherever the wind can take it. And sometimes the wind can take it just any place. You want to have some control over the process. And if anything unskillful appears in the mind at that point, you want to be able to take it apart. So your test case here is distractions, anything related to the world outside right now, you regard as a distraction. That was another question I was given this evening. Well, what about the world outside? Here you are all hiding away in this corner. Why don't you do any service? Or are the problems of the world coming from? They're coming from these states of becoming that everybody creates. And they don't do a very good job of it. So you can help other people so they don't have to suffer from the craving at least to becoming. You have to learn how to master your own. Which means for the time being, anything that has to do with the world outside is a distraction. It's important that you keep that set of values in mind. Then how do you take those distractions apart? The first step is to look for the origination. What causes those things to come up in the mind? And don't look for the origination out there in the world. It's in the mind. When the Buddha uses that word, origination, nine times out of ten, it's about what's coming in from the mind. So say that there's a bout of lust coming into the mind. Okay, what inside the mind sparked it? Remember John Lee's analysis. It's not so much that things out there come in to disturb the mind. We go out, flowing out after them. What sparked that desire to go out? And then you realize that whatever it was, it doesn't last. It's going to pass away. That's the second step, watching it pass away. And sometimes it passes away because you've lost interest in it and there's something else that's more interesting. You may come back to it, but for the time being something else comes in and interferes. Other times it passes away simply because of the nature of fabrications that they last only so long. And then they die away. And you have to watch out for the fact that you may want to pick them up again. Continue the story. That's where you have to look in the third step, which is to look for the allure. What is it about the lust that you find attractive? And at first you say, well, so the object out there is attractive. But then when you realize the mind generated the lust from inside, what did it find attractive about lust in and of itself? This is where it's useful to look in terms of the three fabrications again. You breathe a certain way around it. You talk to yourself about certain things around it, and you have feelings and you have perceptions that go around it as well. And these tend to cluster around. Advertising people have noticed how this is how the mind works, which is why when they're advertising objects, a lot of times you don't even see the object in the, in the advertisement. You see a lifestyle. You see a certain person that you would aspire to want to look like, or act like, or be like. In other words, they create perceptions, mental fabrications for you. So you associate them with the object, the, whatever they're trying to sell. Well, the mind is the same way with itself. 
So you want to see what's the bodily fabrication, what's the way you breathe around this, what's the verbal fabrication, what's the mental fabrication in this allure. And it'll take a while sometimes, because often you're embarrassed about it. And so the mind will whisper to you and then disappear for a bit, leave a little hint here or there, a little subliminal message, and then pretend like nothing had happened until it's gathered its forces, and then you go. When you see that, you say, well, this is what sparks all that. And then you will look for the drawbacks, all the suffering that can come from that. This is where you bring in the, the three perceptions of inconstancy, stress, not self. Or you can think of all those images the Buddha gave for the drawbacks of sensuality. It's like a dog gnawing on a chain of bones. A lot of effort goes into it, but what does it get? No nourishment at all. The only flavor it has is the flavor of its own saliva, as you drool over whatever it is you're lusting for. There's the image of the hawk carrying off a piece of meat, the image of the bead of honey on a knife blade. The hawk carrying the meat has other hawks chasing it, and if it doesn't let go, it's going to get torn apart. The bead of honey, of course, is very sweet, but try to lick it off the blade of the knife, you're going to get cut. The torch that you're carrying is you're going against the wind, and then the wind is blowing the flame back at you. The purpose of all these images is to make you realize that in spending all your time trying to base your happiness on sensuality, you're basing it on something that's, one, out of your control. And two, it's going to harm you. It can lead to a lot of suffering. And you can think of all the stupid things you've done under the power of lust. Until something in my family says, enough. It's not worth it. That's the fifth step, and that's the escape in dispassion. And these are the steps in taking apart a state of becoming. The becoming, say, around the lust. The same thing would apply to anger, jealousy, greed. These are the skills in getting outside of the state of becoming. To see how artificial it is and how it's really not worth all the effort that goes into it. So this is how you take apart your craving that leads to becoming. And this, too, involves tranquility and insight. In the breath meditation, we're working with seeing things as fabricated and calming the fabrication. This tackles, though, tranquility and insight in a different way. You gain insight into the processes of becoming, to the point where you see that they're not worth it. And then as you let them go, the mind goes to a deeper state of peace. So this is why the Buddha has you think about bodily fabrication and metal fabrication when he's giving the breath meditation instructions, because those are precisely the, the tools you're going to need in order to take apart the state of becoming, or to take apart the processes leading up to becoming. So you lose your interest. It's when you lose interest in it, that's when these things can fall apart. Or fall away. This has a parallel in a lot of the Buddha's approaches to the hot issues of his time. The people would argue about whether the world is finite or infinite, eternal or not eternal, the nature of the soul, questions like that. And the Buddha just wasn't interested, because he saw that they were Issues that pulled away from the real problem, which is creating our own suffering. And we like it, the processes in the mind, the craving in the mind. We take as our friend, we take as our companion. Follow it wherever we go. We think that it's what gives pleasure in life, but the Buddha points out, no, it's what actually causes the suffering. So we have to learn how to change our allegiance here, which is one of the reasons why I have to get the mind into concentration. 
is not only does the stillness of concentration allow you to see these processes, but the sense of well-being allows you to look at them with a, less of a sense of interest. You've got something better. Why go for that? This is how you step out. Not by pushing these things away, but simply just letting them fall from your grasp. You hold on to them because you think you're going to get something good out of them. But when you finally realize they don't give anything good at all, just let them go. So as you're working with the breath, remember, you're working with bodily fabrication, mental fabrication, verbal fabrication. Learn how to see the processes of the meditation in these terms. You get hands-on experience, and then you can use these fabrications as tools, not only to get the mind settled down, but to fend off its distractions. A lot of the discernment comes from fending off the distractions. So don't be too irritated by them. Learn to understand the process of how you step out of them. Because that will teach you how to step out of other things as well, even the path. And there are passages where the Buddha talks about. There are passages where the Buddha talks about applying the same five-step program to the five faculties. Conviction. It's a good thing. But even it has its limitations. There comes a time when you have to see its allure and see its drawbacks and let it go. Get this passion for it. The same with persistence, the same with mindfulness, the same with concentration, even discernment. But for the time being, you hold on to these activities. They're going to be your tools. And as the Ajans like to say an image that's common to a lot of the Ajans. It's like being a carpenter. You're working on a piece of furniture. And as long as you're working on the piece of furniture, you've got to hold on to your tools properly. But when the chair or the desk or whatever it is is done, then you put down your tools and enjoy the results of your labor. <laughs>